Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday get together on the cerebellum. Um, today, I'm really pleased to uh, have with us Usta Skepschall, who grew up in Germany and went to Cambridge University, receiving in his bachelor's and master's degree. Then he went to Cold Spring Harbor Lab, where he was the lead author on a couple of revolutionary ideas. Um, the idea of to use DNA sequencing to tag neurons in the brain and then map each neuron's projections separately. So this allowed him to map, for example, about a thousand neurons um, that and their projections uh, in about a week's worth of time. He applied the idea to the locus ceruleus and then to neurons in the visual cortex. Then fortunately for us, he became interested in the cerebellum and evolution of the cerebellum. And he worked with Lee Kuan Luo in uh, Stanford University, where he worked on these questions of evolution of the cerebellar nucleus, which uh, he's going to focus on today. Um, just, Ustas, good to have you. Uh, well, thanks, Reza. Thank you um, all for showing up. And yeah, this, this uh, Tuesday seminar series, I think it's been a, been a great addition to, to, this, to the cerebellum field. So um, anyway, thank you for having me here. Um, all right, I guess I'll hope you can all see the slides. Um, so the big question that we're focused on in, in my lab is really how do how do brains evolve? How do brain cell types, brain regions, and circuit evolve? And we do this because, you know, for the obvious evolutionary interest in that question, but also because I think understanding how the brain elaborates or shrinks and like uh, supports new behavioral functions in an animal really can teach us about the organizational principles uh, behind the brain and, you know, give us hints at, at, at how, how it might actually work um, currently. So just as an outline of this talk, here first we'll, we'll talk about how um, evolution might create new cell types and brain regions, and then uh, about how such regions and cells might be connected to the rest of the brain. Um, first, focusing on the how do you make a new cell type or region. So in this, sorry, um, in this audience, I guess I don't have to defend the choice of going into the cerebellum. Um, because obviously the best brain region, um, but um, we it is otherwise also very useful for these kinds of evolutionary questions because um, very obviously the cerebellum has gained uh, different functions over evolutionary time that all coexist in the cerebellum. So I'm thinking of like you know uh, vestibular uh, functions, motor functions, but also high cognitive functions in in the uh, in mammals, at least, which all nicely lateralized and, and um, exist in different areas of the cerebellum. Now, when we talk about cerebellum, right, a lot of us study uh, the Purkinje cells um, and cerebellar cortex. Um, in this talk, and in generally, I would like to make the pitch that actually, you know, the often somewhat overlooked but uh, brain region of the cerebellum and cerebellum nuclei should really be considered as the, the principal organizer, the principal neurons of the cerebellum, um, because no, essentially none of the computations that are performed by the cerebellar cortex me mean anything to the rest of the brain before they get integrated um, in the cerebellum nuclei and then routed out to the rest of the brain regions. And so this kind of idea of this um, nucleocentric view of the cerebellum, uh, we recently proposed in, in this, you know, basically labor of love um, uh, review of the cerebellum, uh, cerebellum nuclei. And, you know, it's many pages, so if you have a lot of time, you, you should go and read it. Um, but it really covers, um, you know, everything we know about the cerebellum nuclei, but also uh, proposes that this idea that um, usually we think of the cerebellum in a corticocentric a point of view where you know mossy fiber input comes to the it comes into the cortex but, uh, you know you have computations happening in the pinch cells they then uh, send information to the cerebral nuclei that you know kind of act as a relay station before things had hit the the rest of the brain um, but the cerebral nuclei get all uh, mossy fiber input they get uh, inferior all of input um, and the input from the pinch cells really is uh, you know, modul modulatory in many ways, such that you could think of the, the main area of computation in the cerebellum nuclei really to be the, you know, the, the cerebellum nuclei with the Purkinje cells and cerebellum cortex, and they'll be provocative here to, you know, in, in efforts of 
getting maybe some discussion later on, uh, being like a, essentially a giant interneuron on top of the uh, cerebellar nuclei. So anyway, so if you believe, the, anyway, so this uh, will just stick with this nucleocentric point of view. Um, if we look at the cerebellum from an evolutionary perspective, the other thing that is uh, striking from um, is that while cerebellar cortex, you know, changed in in um, size dramatically across the different lineages, um, the you know this crystalline cerebellar motif of you know, granular cells, Purkinje cells, etc., has been maintained. Uh, where really the action has been happening is in the cerebellum nuclei, where we have basically no nuclei in jawless vertebrates, in cartilaginous fish and amphibians, we have a single cerebellar nucleus per hemisphere, in reptiles and birds, we have two, and in mammals, we have three. So it, should, uh, it really seems like the cerebellum nuclei might have evolved from a single ancestral nucleus here at the, you know, in the last common ancestor of all the jawed vertebrates, um, and that this expansion of um, cerebellum nuclei has paralleled the functional expansion of the cerebellum. Now, the Given this, the first question you want to answer is how do you how do you go from one to two to three uh, cerebellar nuclei? Because if you understand how you make a new nucleus um, and what kind of cell types you have in there, then you might understand you know what cerebral computation uh, how cerebral computation changes maybe across these different modalities or how it stays the same. So to do this, we first um, decided to take a uh, you know, dive in and do a deep characterization of the cerebral nuclei in mouse as our home species, look at the brain-wide projections using brain clearing, uh, cell types, and then localize all these cell types in space. And then by comparing the different cerebral nuclei of the mouse, um, come up with hypotheses about how the they, they might have evolved, and then test these hypotheses by looking at the chicken with its two cerebral nuclei, the human with its massively expanded lateral nucleus, and now also in uh, anamniotes. So what did we do? Um, first, we just want to ask, you know, where do the different cerebral nuclei in the mouse actually project to? So very simply, we took just a straight up AAV CAC tomato virus and injected it separately into the medial, the interpose, or the lateral nucleus of the mouse, uh, cleared those brains, and then imaged them volumetrically, detected all the axons. And we can get, uh, you know, volumes, brain volumes like this, where you see in red here all the uh, recovered axons from just a single medial nucleus injection here um, in the right hemisphere. And so what you can see is that a lot of axons, um, basically anything. Uh, you know, posterior to the thalamus is innervated by the cerebral nuclei. Um, to kind of get a grip on this data, the first thing we did is we uh, looked at the brain-wide projection patterns and the brain-wide innovation patterns of for each mice, uh, mouse that we traced um, and did hierarchical clustering of them. And so here each leaf is a, um, is a different mouse, is a brain-wide projection pattern um, of a separate injection. Um, and what you can see very clearly is that not only do our different injection sites cluster with each other, but also the project brain-wide projections of the lateral nucleus are more similar to the brain-wide projections of the interpost nucleus as they are to the uh, medial nucleus, which we've split into an anterior and posterior injection site, which, which matches quite nicely this idea that you know, the lateral nucleus is the youngest, followed genetically speaking, of the nuclei, the medial nucleus is the oldest, um, so that you might have a uh, progressive differentiation of these projection patterns. Now, when we look at um, where these actual projections are in the brain, what we find very strikingly is that it's not like each nucleus has just a completely different projection pattern in the brain and just grew these new projections. But often what we see is uh, they project kind of the same parts of the brain, but then we see shifts in uh, the, the target area is innovated. So here very clearly in the thalamus, for example, you have you know, the fiber bundle coming in and then you have this uh, central region here innovated by the lateral nucleus, more medial uh, region innovated by the uh, medial nucleus and this uh, dorsal ventral, dorsal lateral region innovated by the interpose nucleus. So we see this in the brainstem, in the, obviously in the cerebral cortex, uh, and so on. So we see these progressive shifts of projection patterns across the three different nuclei in the mouse. To see um, if we can find any molecular underpinnings of these uh, changes in projection patterns, we then uh, wanted to characterize the cell types in the cerebral nuclei. And so here we took mouse, uh, dissected out the three cerebral nuclei separately from each other, isolated uh, neuronal nuclei, sorted for neurons, and then did deep, you know, 
million cell million reads a cell uh, sequencing of these things. So this is still plate seq, um, so one one cell a well. Um, and you know, obviously, there's excitor and inhibitory cells in the uh, cerebellum nuclei. And so, if we first look at the inhibitory cells, what we see very clearly is that these are relatively homogeneous. They only fall into three separate classes of neurons. And when we look at where each of these uh, neurons come from with respect to the different cerebellum nuclei that we've dissected, um, what we see is that they're all intermingled. So they, we seem to have these uh, very uh, relatively homogeneous. Uh, nucleus invariant inhibitory cells. So this is in uh, striking contrast to what we see for the excitatory cells, where um, at the same clustering resolution as these inhibitory cells, um, we recover a lot more different clusters, a lot more different cell types. Um, and when we look at where these cells are coming from, it appears that each of these different clusters is specific to just a single cerebellum nucleus. Now, if we think about this now from a uh, evolutionary perspective, you might imagine that um, if the cerebral nuclei have all evolved from a single ancestral nucleus, we should find cell types that correspond to each other across the different nuclei that are evolutionarily related to each other, uh, so-called sister cell types. Now, you know, this is obviously trivially true for the inhibitory cells that are the same across the different nuclei. Uh, for the excitatory cells, uh, to try to figure this out, we uh, did the simple hierarchical clustering of these cell types again. Um, and what you can see here is, um, that this population of excitatory cell types across the cerebral nuclei splits very clearly into two, right down the middle, um, into what we'll call class A cell types and class B cell types. And what you see here in this color bar is that each of the different class A cell types uh, has mem or class A cell types um, occur in each of the three different cerebral nuclei as do class B cell types. And so that we can consider you know, all class A cell types, sister cell types to each other, not class B cell types, sister cell types to each other. Um, what was intriguing though, is that often we find more than one cell type per class per nucleus. Now this might just be what it is, or uh, to us it suggests that maybe we dissected too large a chunk um, and didn't analyze the cerebral nuclei at high enough spatial resolution. So to figure this out, we turn to uh, in situ sequencing, um, in our case, STAMAP in situ sequencing, was which is basically just you know highly multiplexed in situ, um, and uh, went to localize all the different cell types we had identified um, in space. So what you're looking at here is a coronal section somewhere halfway down the mouse cerebral nuclei, rough drawn in uh, in dashed lines uh, subdivisions of the cerebral nuclei. Uh, you, know, you can find in the atlas, uh, we'll call them subnuclei, you know, you recognize anterior and posterior interpose, medial, lateral, medial nucleus, and so on. Um, when we take all the cells that we've uh, recovered from in this in the same section, color them in by cell types, you get this mess, which is relatively hard to digest. Um, but if you just look at the excitatory cells and color them in by class, what you see is that each subnucleus contains both class A and class B cell types. Um, and then when we break this down further and look at only class A or class B cell types and color them in by their actual cell type, what is immediately obvious and striking is that each of these different uh, excitatory cell types seems to be constrained to just a single subnucleus, suggesting that really this organizational unit of the cerebral nuclei in mouse is this, are these subnuclei um, that each contain um, one, one uh, roughly one class A cell type, one class B cell type, and then the three nucleus invariant uh, cell inhibitory cell types. If we look at the same thing from the evolutionary perspective, then this obviously directly suggests that the, uh, the all these different subnuclei might have evolved by a process of duplication of this whole cell type set, um, followed by some divergence, um, so that you just kind of plop in copies of these different subnuclei next to each other with this expanding cerebellum over evolutionary time. Now, if this duplication and divergence hypothesis is true, um, what you would expect is that if you looked in a different animal, uh, say the chicken, that has a different number of cerebral nuclei, in this case two, we would still find um, these three classes of uh, nucleus invariant inhibitory cells, and then some number of subnuclei that each contain both class A and class B excitatory cells. So to test this, we got ourselves some chickens, dissected out the cerebral nuclei, sequenced them just like we did the mouse cell types, um, and then looked at first the inhibitory cells. And what you see here again in this TSNA plot is again, like in the mouse, we have a relatively homogeneous population falling to three big classes. Um, 
And when we do the correlation between mouse cell types and chicken cell types um, in clean expression space, what we see is a very nice one-to-one -one correspondence of these inhibitory cell types across the species with some expansion and contraction uh, in the, in, at, the, at the subclass level. Um, when we look at the excitatory cell types, the first problem we had to overcome is that actually for the chicken, we can't just look in the atlas and find these uh, is subnuclei, um, but we first had to define them. Uh, but what we've seen in the mouse is that if you um, coarsely cluster the um, mouse excitatory cell types, then they would fall roughly into uh, subnuclei. Uh, boundaries. And so we did the same thing in the chicken, coarsely clustered these excitatory cell types, and then did a hierarchical clustering of these average uh, gene expression patterns for the uh, chicken coarse clusters and the um, subnuclei in the mouse. And what you can see is a nice intermingling of chicken and mouse um, with the clusters and subnuclei, uh, suggesting that in the chicken we have something like a medial nucleus, a lateral medial nucleus, a posterior interpost nucleus, um, but then that the uh, lateral nucleus and the anterior interpost seem to be uh, mouse specific, as we might have imagined from uh, certainly the lateral nucleus being a mammalian specific invention. Um, and then we find these other two clusters here um, that appear to be chicken specific, which we'll term uh, int X as a, as a, you know, another interpost nucleus that, that is, exists in the, in the avian lineage. Now confirm that actually we do have these roughly four um, subnuclei in the chicken. We again did, uh, went in C2 and looked for marker genes for these different nuclei. So here you have again a coronal section uh, through the chicken cerebellar nuclei. And if we look at um, where these different uh, cell types fall, we indeed find that the most medial nucleus is uh, what we would have expected to be the medial nucleus, the, next to it, the lateral medial, medial nucleus, and then the posterior interpost equivalent uh, nucleus. You can't see the index nucleus in this section, but it basically forms a rostral cap um, to, to the cerebellar nuclei in the chicken. Uh, so then indeed, we, we seem to have these four subnuclei uh, three of which correspond nicely to mouse. Um, when we then take these same cell types and cluster them at much higher resolution, such that um, you know, we actually reveal not subnuclei, but cell types, um, then again, we get a much higher diversity. We get about 17 different clusters here, which we can correlate to the mouse excitatory cell types. And what you can see here is that there's chicken uh, excitatory cell types that correlate nicely to mouse class A cell types, that are anti-correlated to mouse class B cell types, and vice versa, suggesting that indeed we have both class A and class B cells in the chicken cerebral nuclei. If we plot the color these in here on the TSNI plot in uh, hot colors for class A cell types and cold colors for class B cell types, and then I draw in dashed lines, the div dividing lines for the uh, subnuclei, then it's also immediately clear that in each of the different subnuclei, you have both hot and cold colors. Um, you have both class A and class B subtypes. So with this, then we propose this model that um, there's such a thing as an archetypal cerebellar subnucleus that contains these three inhibitory cell types, cell classes um, that are nucleus invariant, and then class A and class B excitatory cells. That over evolution, this uh, archetypal subnucleus got repeatedly duplicated through some you know, developmental mechanism uh, to give rise to all the different uh, subnuclei that we um, see in, in extant species. Now, obviously, uh, you don't just make more uh, cerebral nuclei. These nuclei also change in size, often dramatically. Uh, for example, the, the, I guess the most famous example is the dentate or lateral nucleus of the human that it you know, ballooned up to about like what 27 times the size of the other two nuclei, uh, whereas in the mouse, they, you know, roughly a one to one to one in, in, in terms of volume. And so to see what is up with this massive expansion, whether this is actually just lots of different subnuclei next to each other in the uh, human lateral nucleus, or whether you have, you know, just a much bigger nucleus, um, we got postmortem human cerebellar dissected out the different uh, uh, cerebral nuclei in the mouse, in the human, um, sequenced them just as the mouse and chicken. And then if you look at the inhibitory cells here, you get actually something that looks remarkably like the mouse um, cell types. Um, you get 
you know, these three classes of inhibitory neurons that are shared across the different subnuclei. And when we correlate them to the mouse, we find one-to-one -one matches nicely, even at the subclass level uh, uh, between mouse and humans. Um, when we look at the excitatory cell types, again, we find a much higher diversity of cell types. Um, but when you look at where these cell types are coming from, again, we obviously have, we have nucleus-specific excitatory cell types, but all of the cells from the lateral nucleus fall just into a single cluster. Um, it's much bigger, which you know, we try to separate out in, in many different ways, but literally they're just they're, they're all the same. Um, and when we do the correlation to the mouse, in, uh, mouse excitatory cells uh, from the human excitatory cells, we see that the medial and interposed nuclei of the human have both the cells that correspond to mouse class A and class B cell types, but the human lateral nucleus fell squarely into only class B. Uh, so that we seem to have um, a deviation of um, the human dentate nucleus from this canonical cerebral nuclei motif of uh, A and B cell types in each of the different cerebral nuclei. Now, uh, what do class A and class B cell types do in the lateral nucleus? This was the obvious next question. Um, now we can't do any tracing in the uh, in humans. Also, they don't have class A cell types. Uh, the next next best thing is we turn to our mouse data, um, and through a bunch of you know conditional tracing and, and retrograde approaches, uh, we figured out how to label the uh, projections of the mouse lateral nucleus for class A cell types and class B cell types. Um, and so you see these here in green for class A and uh, magenta for class B. Um, you know, and so there's obviously some regions that are innovated only by one or the other. Uh, in thalamus here, um, you know, often what we see is a different nucle uh, thalamic nuclei innovated um, by both of the um, class A and class B cell types, but not in overlapping areas of the subnuclei. And so to really divvy this up and figure out if such topographic projections here mattered, um, in terms of brain-wide wiring of these class A and class B cell types in the lateral nucleus, um, we then took this data and combined it with data available from the Allen Institute, where you can ask for each spot in the brain, for each voxel, uh, where um, these voxels project to, or what the probability of connection to other, all the other voxels in the brain are. And so we took all the regions in the thalamus that get primarily class B uh, input and asked, where do those regions project to? and took all the other voxels in the thalamus that uh, get primarily class A input, and asked where do these project to. When we do this, again here in class A and class B, in, in green and magenta, you have class A and class B, now second order projections through the thalamus, and we get a very nice segregation where the class B cell types, the ones that are maintained in the uh, human, project to the very frontal pole of the uh, of cortex and to optofrontal cortex, um, and the ventral um, striatum and the class A cell types, the ones that are lost, project to, you know, MPFC um, and to the dorsal striatum. Uh, not necessarily the um, projection pattern we would have expected, uh, but I guess this is, this is what it is um, and, you know, adds to the confusion about what a, um, what the mouse prefrontal cortex might even be. Um, but anyway, so concluding this here from from this comparison um, is that we generally have this duplication and divergence model where the archetypal subnucleus get repeatedly duplicated to give rise to all the different cerebral nuclei. But then there seems to be uh, the possibility to fine tune the different abundance of these cell types and expand um, certain populations at the expense of other ones. Now, if you've been paying attention, um, this is all in amniotes, so this is not really um, a true uh, description of what necessarily happens across the entire uh, phylogenetic tree to the cerebral nuclei. And so starting the my lab here uh, at Hopkins, we um, really wanted to know, does this model generalize? What does this single ancestral cerebral nucleus looks like? And so uh, postdoc in my lab, Dylan Feltin Gonzalez, uh, dove into this first focusing on uh, Xenopus tropicalis as a representative model system for the amphibians. Um, there, the cerebral nuclei is just sitting right below the granule cells, as you, as you might expect. They're very small uh, and somewhat annoying. 
Um, but he, Dylan collected a whole bunch of uh, high quality single set nucleus RNA sequencing data. He had now uh, 10x, um, obviously showing granule cells, protein cells, and, and molecular interneurons, all the things you might expect. Um, and then this cluster of cell types that might be cerebral nuclei, might be vestibular nuclei, um, you know, that, that we couldn't quite tell which one switched. Um, and so he optimized STAMAP and CP sequencing for the frog. And we have, um, can look at lots of genes, um, you know, in this case, 105 genes um, that we selected based on our single nucleus RNA sequencing data with much better readout than, than what we had previously in optimized uh, sequencing chemistry and the like. And what you get then is uh, coronal sections through the frog cerebellum um, that looks something like this. Each dot here is a uh, different cell colored in uh, by its cell type. Um, and so, you know, I guess it looks a bit like confetti, but if you um, maybe, you know, if we, if we look at only a few cell types, the ones that we might be interested in, you very nearly see here the granule cell layer, uh, the Purkinje cell layer, the molecular layer, interneurons on top. And then in here in golden, um, we have the excited cerebral and nuclei neurons, um, which we can, Oops, yep, there they are. Uh, which we can then uh, neatly fit back onto our TSNI plot. Uh, just this tiny little population of cells here <coughs> are the excited cerebral uh, nuclear neurons. And so now we can actually do these evolutionary comparisons. And uh, I guess it won't be showing any of this, but it, it's uh, quite intriguing and tantalizing. Um, now, because Dylan is actually a, you know, an evolutionary biologist, um, he wanted to do better than just looking at one thing and you know not know whether this is the exception or the rule. And so we're also looking at lungfish, uh, lungfish as the sister group to the tetrapods. Um, and basically the last group in which, um, or the most basal group of vertebrates in which the cerebral nuclei have been identified without any confusion, any, any debate about them. And so uh, we got ourselves some um, West African lungfish and it's you know, kind of remarkable what you can get online uh, with a credit card, but you know, here we are. Um, and you know, we sequenced yeah, the cerebellum to be, as best we could doing single cell RNA sequencing. Um, uh, in stem up and C2 sequencing works. Uh, so now we're, we're just in the process of cranking through this, uh, identifying where the cerebellum nuclei actually are and how they correspond um, to uh, the cerebellum nuclei cell types of the other species. So uh, stay tuned. Um, but what does this all mean? I said maybe we, we were doing these evolutionary comparisons to understand how, you know, maybe learn something about the function of the cerebellum. Um, so we proposed this model of duplication and divergence of the cerebellum nuclei, um, which then explains the expansion of the cerebellum nuclei, but doesn't tell us anything about what, you know, how the rest of the cerebellum might be gaining functionality. Um, if we you know, take our nucleocentric approach and dig through the literature, actually what we do find is that, uh, thanks to, to work from Alex Klona and other labs, uh, is that there's evidence that the cerebral nuclei, the first born, the excitatory cerebral nuclei cells, the first born neurons of the cerebellum uh, really control um, the size and shape of the, uh, the whole organ of the whole cerebellum by scaling the number of Purkinje cells, which then in turn scale the number of granule cells. So in some world, um, and you know, this is wild speculation, uh, you might find that you make another cerebral nucleus and the rest of the cerebellum grows with it. Um, so I'll leave you. Um, all right, so I think I have about 10 minutes um, to talk about um, the other half of my lab, where we're actually trying to then understand, like you make another cerebellum nucleus, how does it connect to the rest of the brain? We have no idea, basically, in general. We don't know how uh, its connectivity evolves, uh, whether it duplicates just like the cell types and, and the brain regions that we've in the, in the model that we've just proposed, or whether there's some splitting or refinement of, of projection patterns going on. And the reason we don't know is basically because the best we can do at scale um, is this, this the bulk tracing as we've done uh, in the cerebellum, but it doesn't really tell us about single cells. It doesn't allow us to integrate between clean expression and uh, the project, projection patterns. Um, and uh, really it doesn't, it doesn't quite cut it if you wanna do this large scale comparison. Um, it's really not on par with 
what we can do in the transcriptomics world right now. Um, and so we need to upgrade our anatomical approaches. Um, so in my PhD under uh, Tony Zeta, he came up with this idea of barcoding, you know, sequencing the connectome, barcoding the brain, basically stealing um, the idea of cellular barcoding from developmental biology and using it uh, for connectivity mapping. And the idea here is that instead of using colors um, and different fluorophores to distinguish individual neurons, um, to use a label that actually has enough diversity to label all the neurons in the brain in a single experiment. And so these are uh, nucleic acid sequences or barcodes. And you know, because they're sequences, if you stick together just random nucleotides, um, maybe 30 of them in a row, you have four to the 30, that's 10 to the 18 possible different sequences, therefore 10 to the 18 possible labels that you can all read out quickly by Illumina sequencing and that are uniquely identifiable. So you have plenty of diversity to label as many cells uh, as, you, as you might wish. The other neat thing is that because these are nucleic acid sequences, they are automatically in the same language, in the same realm as the transcriptome, as the genome. And so uh, offer this, this a possibility of directly integrating between uh, connectivity, which usually was in the realm of imaging, and uh, transcriptomics, which was in the realm of sequencing. So how does one use barcodes to map connectivity? Just flying through this briefly, but basically, the first thing we came up with is MapSeq. We take a virus, uh, in this case, a Syndes virus, and you barcode each individual virus particle. So each virus particle carries a unique barcode. Um, we can make you know, pools of these with 100 million different barcode sequences in them now. You take them, inject them into your favorite brain region, in this case, you know, maybe the cerebellar nuclei, um, and you titer the virus such that each infected neuron gets infected with roughly one, one virus particle, so they're for uniquely labeled with the barcode carried by those virus particles. We can then express the barcode as an mRNA, prop the cell full uh, with it, just as we would usually do it with um, uh, GFP, for example. And then in the belts and suspenders approach, actually ex co-express an engineered presynaptic protein that will specifically bind to the barcode RNA and get trafficked out into the uh, presynapse, dragging the barcode RNA along with it. So what you then get is a brain with thousands of cells uniquely labeled with different barcode sequences and all the axons prop fall with these mRNAs that each molecule of which encodes the barcode sequence and therefore tells you which cell it's coming from. Um, and so all you have to do is dissect out potential target regions, sequence the barcodes you find in there. And then if you say up here, you find barcode 78, you know there must have been a neuron back there labeled with barcode 78 that was sending the axon up there. If you find the same barcode down here, uh, then you know this axon was sending a you know, branching projection to the two different brain regions. If you find one only down here and not up there, you know this other neuron was projected only down here. And so by just looking through all the barcodes you find in the different target regions, you can reconstruct these uh, uh, projection matrices at single cell resolution and get information about how all of the different neurons that you labeled um, are projecting at, while maintaining single cell resolution. Now, as I already mentioned, because these barcodes are uh, uh, mRNAs, uh, the you know the sequencing machine doesn't really you know the, won't know. So what you can do is you can take out the injection site, maintain the cells, do single cell RNA sequencing of them, um, and then in addition to sequencing the endogenous transcriptome, which is what you know those technologies are built for, you will automatically also sequence the barcode mRNAs because they basically just look like a regular RNA. And so you get your um, single cell transcriptome information and then for every cell also which barcode identity it has. So if you combine these into one experiment, you can tell for each of the different cells, not only where it's um, projecting to, but also which genes it's expressing. So we get this nice uh, correspondence between gene expression and or transcriptomically defined cell type and connectomically defined cell types. Uh, we can all, also, thanks to work from Shang Chen, who's now at the Allen Institute, uh, we can do, um, do this whole thing in C2. We can read out backhold sequences directly in the tissue um, as well as endogenous genes and still do map seek tracing of the projections. Um, now, you, so this is very, very useful. And uh, we're currently working on putting this in place in the cerebellar nuclei. Um, but in some ways, 
you know, MapSeq is still a traditional tracing method, right? Like if you, you're interested in the projections from one brain region, you inject them, you map those projections out now at single set of resolution. Um, but if you want to look at a different brain region, then, um, you know, you've got to take another mouse inject there in that other brain region. And then if you want to lo learn about networks, you have to collate the data from all these different experiments. But give, because we have such high barcode diversities, and really the unit of tracing in these MAPSIG experiments is the single barcode itself, um, we figure we could do better. We could really scale up to doing whole brain tracing in just single animals. And so this is the idea behind BrickSeq, which I developed together with Long Wen Huang, is now at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And so what this is, is the idea of um, basically MAPSIG on steroids. So instead of injecting in just one brain region, labeling barcodes there and seeing where all the axons end up, you inject all of the brain, hundreds of sites, label as many neurons as you can, um, and then dissect the whole brain into, into barcode chunks. And then you can post hoc identify where each cell had its soma, because it turns out that soma, somata are really big, have lots of barcodes in them, much more so than the axons will. And so by just looking for where you have a spike in barcode abundance, you can, we can we've shown this, you can identify uh, very reliably where each cell has its barcode. And so in a single experiment here, um, we can map out, you know, for 70,000 traced neurons all across cortex, um, can map out the projections from one hemisphere of cortex to itself, to the contralateral site and subcortical regions in just, this is from a single black six animal. Um, and now we can show that this, you know, this is accurate and whatnot, but really the power here is that now, because this is a single experiment that, you know, two, two students can do in, in the course of a couple of weeks, um, you can really start doing um, comparative connectomics of molecular identified cells. So start comparing connectivity across species or across conditions, if you so like, um, and see changes in connectivity, just like we would usually see changes um, in the transcriptomic patterns um, in, in just the pure transcriptomic experiments, like in the first half of this talk. Um, and so now we're, we, we're really trying to tackle this question of how does uh, cerebral, chain, cerebral connectivity change when we add a set of nucleus. We are trying to put these tracing techniques into birds, reptiles, amphibians, and, and maybe even sharks. Um, and so to do this, we have to, uh, you know, overcome two main challenges. One, you know, you obviously need to infect cells. So does your virus work? And then is the barcode being trafficked? If, if those two things are true, then MAPSeq, BASeq, BrickSeq, all of those uh, just work in these different species. So to um, trial run this, we're focusing on the zebra finch, um, where with our regular virus already, we get a little bit of infection of you know, beautiful kinky cell infection and uh, infection of cells in the forebrain, axons into the cerebral nuclei. Um, but we can do a lot better in infectivity if we actually choose the correct pseudotype. If we, we've been playing a lot of games with, uh, with pseudotyping synthesis virus in, in, in different ways um, to get high infections. We can then also show that indeed, at least the Purkinje cells um, nicely traffic RNA into the cerebral nuclei. Uh, but again, we can do better on this and screening different proteins to drag out the barcode RNA. Um, so again, keep your eyes peeled. Um, we are growing as a lab. We're recruiting people on at all levels. So if, you, if any of this is interesting to you, uh, hit me up. Let me know. I'm happy to discuss. And so you know, thank you all to to all the people in my lab and all the funding we've been able to to raise. And of course, um, a lot of the work that I started off talking about, all the mouse, chicken, and human work in the cerebral nuclei, comes from my postdoc lab in Beach and Lowe's lab in Stanford, uh, who's been fantastic throughout all of this. And of course, the, a lot of the backloading work comes out of Tony Zeta's lab and, and Colson Hathaway where I did my PhD. So with that, um, happy to take any questions. Rustas, thank you so much. Uh, David Linden had a question. David, do you want to go ahead and ask Rustas your question? Should I stop sharing or? Uh, hey, Rustas, that was Hi. great. Thank you so much for, uh, for an exciting presentation. I have one technical question. 
And that is, I know in a lot of the uh, brain regions where we record, like neocortex or, or lateral habenula, there are neurons that are not new and positive. Yeah. So when you use new and positivity as the basis for your facts, yeah. are there classes that you could be missing in cerebellar nuclei? Yeah, so we were, we were um, uh, very concerned about this because actually in the uh, cerebral nuclei, um, new end standing exists, but it's weak, much weaker than, than elsewhere. Um, which, and some, some literature has it that indeed these cells are new and negative. And they certainly are relative to granule cells. Um, so uh, yes, that is a concern. We uh, sorted more broadly also and sorted new and negative cells also. Um, so they, I don't think we missed much. Um, and then follow this up in C2 without any screening for, uh, for new N. It's mostly in, in the cerebral nuclei, if you do sing, I mean, and many other of these subcortical regions, um, there's so much white matter that some sorting strategy really helps um, because otherwise you only sequence all the good endrocytes. Yes. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's, it can be a concern. Yeah, and, and, and actually what you said, thank you. And you know, what you said about there being a lot of white matter there, you know, just as, as, as an old guy in the room, I think it's worthwhile saying that, you know, a lot of what we think about as theoretical orientations, like what you've called nucleocentric or, mm -hmm. or corticocentric, really didn't come so much from any real theoretical ideas. They just came from what you could record at the time. In other words, there was a long period of time where you couldn't record from nuclear neurons very well. Yeah. Uh, and I know because my lab very st struggled. We were in the early days in the 90s recording from the brain slices. And it turns out there's a bunch of tricks you've, you've, you've got to figure out. And, and you couldn't do it until modern brain slicers machines were invented. And so, you know, I just want to say that, you know, I think you're making this distinction as valid and reasonable. But I, want to, I just want to temper it with the idea that it's not always, when you look at that old literature, it's not always that it came about because of some deep philosophical idea about how the cerebellum worked, but rather the technical limitations that existed at the time. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Actually, I'm, I'm making this point more strongly than I made you personally believe it, mostly to, to um, see what comes back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> obviously, I mean, you know, everybody knows about the basic circuit, right? It's not like that. Uh, people are just ignoring things willfully. Thank you, David. Um, Violetta, you had a question. Yes, thank you. First of all, really cool science. I like it. Um, and I, I also enjoy very much the, the Trebellum um, lecture paper that you mentioned mm -hmm. in the beginning. Yeah. And I saw that there's a graph with evolution uh, of the DCN across the mammal species. Mm -hmm. You compared, and I was curious, what is your take on why the FN and the interpositus shrank so much with evolution in mammals? And the three possibilities that I thought would be that uh, is either the, the functions became less important for FN and interpositus, or they became more efficient, or they were shifted to the dentate. So what, what is your take based also on the yeah. cellular uh, investigation you did. Yeah. So the dentate nucleus expansion is actually, uh, evolutionary speaking, a very recent phenomenon. So this is only true in uh, great apes. So even uh, macaques still have a relatively even sizing of the cerebellar nuclei. And the uh, expansion, so, you know, we don't usually talk about this, but the intervals got really big in uh, dolphins, for example. Um, and not the lateral nucleus. So I don't, you know, um, it's not that these the functions in the medial and interpost nucleus are no longer important. I think that in the new humans and, and great apes specifically, um, the the hemispheres have grown, um, and maybe it, not that the other ones have shrunken. <laughs> that makes yeah, yeah, but the fen looks so small, right? in humans, for example, compared to rodents. So that's why for, and they are more yeah, physiological but I think, functions. I mean, compared, to a, compared to a rodent, they're still much bigger. <laughs> I mean, 
yeah so i yeah i don't know i don't i don't yeah i don't want to necessarily speculate too much here, but yeah yeah okay thank you thank you violetta um Ustas, I had a question about the two different types of excitatory cells, class A and class B. Um, would you like to speculate about their function and how they might differ? Um, so we know a little bit about their function. So actually two different class types of excitatory neurons have been reported in the lateral nucleus of mouse uh, based on patching. Um, and um, so it turns out we, we did, little, did a little bit of patch seek to, to make the match. And indeed, it seems like these, these, our distinction and the electrophysiological distinction do map onto each other. So the B-type cells are uh, bigger, uh, fire faster, and have you know, shorter interspike intervals and, and narrower action potentials and things like that. Um, I had... Yeah, I don't know. We don't have enough tracing data, I think, um, for knowing whether, well, I think Sasha might have some interest, Sasha Dulac might have some interesting data regarding this, whether these different types of excitatory cells actually get different input from the cerebellar cortex or whether they get the same input, but compute different things on it based on their you know, different size and different electrophysiological properties. Um, I mean, they must be important because they've been conserved for hundreds of millions of years in, in you know, across vastly different lifestyles. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I think we need to do more mapping to even figure out like basic, basic connectivity principles for these. Are there any other questions for, uh, for Ustas? Yes, go ahead. Thanks, Reza. So Ustas, I was curious if you could comment on if the evolution of DCNs parallel or are independent of those of uh, cerebellar-like structures in the brain. Hmm. Um, yes, uh, I, I mean, I have no data. I've, I've, I've you know, thought about these things. Um, well, so this goes back to, I think, um, you know, the jawless vertebrates, they don't have a nu have nuclei and may or may not have a cerebellum, um, depending on who you are, um, have cerebellum-like structures. And there's the hypothesis that maybe the DON and some vestibular nuclei as a unit duplicated to give rise to what then became the cerebellum um and nuclei mm -hmm. um and then it, it went from there um i think we now have the tools to actually go and look and compare vestibular nuclei versus cerebellum nuclei in you know well at least you know sharks and uh look at lampreys and and whatnot and so some data has been collected in lampreys um but yeah, we, we don't have any yet but i think this is going to be extremely intriguing with a, you know, there, there's a lot of parallels between vestibular nuclei and cerebellum nuclei, obviously. Mm -hmm. So it'll be it'll be exciting to see where the cerebellum in the first place came from. I think these these tools are the right ones. Great, thanks. Thank you, Ustas. That was just wonderful, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, let me ask one last time, or if there are any questions for Ustas. Well, if not, I hope you have a wonderful July, rest of July and August. And those of you who are going to the Gordon Conference, I look forward to seeing you. Um, and we will continue our uh, seminars in September. Have a wonderful, wonderful time during your holidays. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>